For me, the, the point is it brings you much closer to the experience of these artists, what they lived, how they felt, you know, uh, how they were inspired, what they brought back with them. By knowing with more detail where they were, who they met, you get a much better appreciation for did they have time to wash out their socks back at the hotel and would they drive by the morning and, you know, and, and, uh, and little minutia like that, that I think makes this whole thing a lot more human. That is author and director Ted Thomas, who's here along with J.B. Kaufman and Didier Guest to talk about their new book, Walt Disney and El Grupo in Latin America. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Hey there, welcome to this special episode of the Tomorrow Society Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Heaton. The reason it's special, one, I have three guests. That has never happened before in the past 240 episodes of the show. Second thing is we're talking about a really cool book as part of the monograph series from the Hyperion Historical Alliance. It's about the trip Walt Disney and his El Grupo took to South America in 1941. The book includes a detailed itinerary from what they did, some amazing photos, and we talk all about how the book came together and also the impact on the Disney company, including films like Saludos Amigos and The Three Caballeros, but just a lot more from these three accomplished historians that have done so much to spread the word about Disney and its past. So let's do this. Here are Ted, Didier, and JB. <laughs> Let's introduce each of these three talented authors individually. So I'm going to start with my first guest is a film director and producer whose work includes the documentaries Walt and El Grupo, Growing Up with Nine Old Men, and Frank and Ollie, where one of the subjects is his father, Disney animator Frank Thomas. It is Ted Thomas. Ted, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, definitely. I'm very excited to talk with you. Well, next up is an author and film historian who's written regularly about Disney history in books like The Fairest One of All, South of the Border with Disney, The Making of Walt Disney's Fun and Fancy Free, so much more. It is J.B. Kaufman. J.B., thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, for having us. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Oh, definitely. And my final guest is also a historian and author who's written countless articles and books about Disney, including his Waltz People interview series, which I believe is up to 28 volumes. And that it might even be more at this point. There's so many. It is Didier Guess. Didier, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, 29 volumes, and the next one is about to be released. So, yes. Wow, I can't even keep up with all of them. And I've read quite a few, but um, but I mean that in a good way, not in a bad way. So <laughs> I'm going to start and kind of ask each of you. First, we're talking about this book, which includes what I think is so cool. is has a really detailed itinerary. And I wouldn't just say itinerary, but like what people did and so many great photos. But before we do that, just in case listeners aren't as familiar with what Disney did in 1941 and the trip, I'd love to know a little bit more about this. So I'm going to ask you, Ted, to get us started here since you have directed a documentary on this. But if people aren't familiar with the trip that's commonly known as Walt Nell Grupo, like what's a quick overview of kind of why they did it and how it happened? It's real important to remember that this was in 1941. Uh, World War II had already begun on the European continent, and there was quite a lot of concern in Washington, D.C., that uh, the U.S. was going to be pulled into it pretty soon. And so there was a concerted effort in the government to try and improve relations with uh, the rest of the hemisphere. So that was uh, the political reason for the trip, that the, the U.S. government wanted to have a goodwill tour uh, to South America to uh, try and strengthen alliances. And from the Disney standpoint, uh, they had been asked as part of this to come up with ideas to make films about uh, Latin American subjects. 
And it wasn't just the Disney studio. The same request was being made of the other major studios in, in Hollywood as well. Uh, but what was very different about the, the Disney trip was that everybody had done their homework. And uh, the trip actually resulted in creating substantial goodwill. And one might also say strengthening alliances between the the different nations of the of the hemisphere. Oh yeah, and that's interesting. I wasn't as familiar with so many others being asked because Disney is the one I'm obviously most familiar with. Well, this leads well into a question I have for you, JB, which um if people aren't as familiar, I know a lot of us know the Three Caballeros and Saludos Amigos, but just the impact on Disney's film output, just as a kind of a summary if people don't know that much about it, just overall, what impact it had on kind of what they did going forward? Well, it had a great impact. Um, as, as Ted has just mentioned, they had kind of a twofold approach here. They were, they were strengthening the Good Neighbor program just by being there. And then they were, later on, they were making these films, which also became part of the, the uh, Good Neighbor program. The obvious examples are Saludos Amigos and, and Three Caballeros. But in fact, they started... Practically the minute they got back, they started working on any number of story ideas with Latin themes. Uh, some of those stories were, were absorbed into those two features, but there were many, many others. And some of them were released as, as standalone shorts. And other ideas kept on being adapted and molded into different shapes. Blame it on the Samba was going to be in that third Latin American feature that was never completed, but Blame It on the Samba was was too good to abandon. So eventually it shows up at the end of the 1940s in the package feature Melody Time. And you can find uh, traces of many of those other ideas popping up unexpectedly in other stories uh, for years after uh, those those two well-known Good Neighbor films. Yeah, that's so interesting that they you know, because again, most people know about it through the main films, but how much, how many more they ended up doing beyond that. Well, also, I wanted to ask you, uh, DDA, about what was happening with Disney at the time, because I know with the labor unrest and everything else, like what was, how important was this for Walt and the company, given what was going on? And also, they were struggling with revenues too, given the, the war that Ted mentioned. Like, what was the atmosphere like there as they then were gone for multiple months? Sure. I'll uh, let also Ted and JB answer that one. But yeah, I mean, the, the studio was in a bad way. Uh, it it had released movies that had not been as successful as they expected. Um, uh, Pinocchio being one of them. Uh, and uh, and so um, they were struggling a little bit financially. Um, the strike uh, obviously had just started uh, in May of, uh, of, of 41. And the strike wasn't directly linked to the trip to Latin America. In fact, it, it, it wasn't, but uh, it, it did help for the resolution of the tri- strike that Walt wasn't necessarily there and, and therefore was uh, let the, the strike resolution in the hands of his brother um, and, and a few others. And so um, it was, there were dark clouds, absolutely, uh, at, at the studio uh, at, at the time. And the business that the government was bringing to Disney uh, was, was good to take. Uh, it was was um, it was really helping the, the studio now JB and Ted you probably want to to give uh, uh, more details about about all of this um, because you have researched this in, in a lot more detail than, than I have well a common misconception is that the government paid uh, Disney for this trip to take place but uh, actually uh, to get into the nitty-gritty of it the government put up loan guarantees against the films. Uh, you know, because the the studio is so strapped for cash. I mean, they were ha- having difficulty even making payroll. And the idea of starting a, a new project was almost impossible. And so uh, what this trip made possible was for uh, the government to say to the bank, uh, look, if uh, if Walt makes a film and it doesn't earn its cost back, we'll cover the difference. We'll cover the loan. And so with that guarantor on the loan, they were able to go forward. And that was the scenario that was in place for both of the features that we talked about. But JB can give a little more context to that, too, I'm sure. Well, the others have 
pretty well laid out the whole story here, but the happy <laughs> ending is that in the end, they didn't need those guarantees. Saludos Amigos was, was tremendously successful. Three Caballeros, maybe not quite as much, but uh, they didn't have the same situation that they had had with, uh, with Pinocchio and Fantasia. But, but as Ted has suggested, this uh, opportunity was a real lifeline for the studio. Uh, it was, to, to Walt especially, I think he really enjoyed the idea that instead of getting bogged down in all of these troubles, they were actually embarking on a new project. And he loved new things. He, he loved to try new ideas and, and, and not just dwell on what had already been done. So you get a real feeling of joy, I think, from seeing uh, these films and seeing the excitement that Walt and the artists had over getting into a new project like this, especially one with with such a, a colorful uh, side to it. What is remarkable uh, uh, about this is that uh, this was the first time the the studio had undertaken a research trip like this. Uh, you know, since then it has become common practice that if you're going to do a film about somewhere else or uh, a different locale, you go there and scope things out to, to first. But this was the very first time. And as a consequence, uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, documentation that was done within the group, mostly snapshots and and a lot of uh, 16 millimeter footage which was, sh was shot, but that was for reference purposes at first. It, there, there was no idea of, of folding that into a finished film the way it actually eventually became used. It's so interesting the the way just how much went into going into this trip, and so I'd love to know a little bit before we dive into the book itself about each of your kind of inspirations or what interests you about being involved in this type of book, and even some of the work you've done in the past. So I'll start with you, Ted, because obviously you directed the documentary Well Nagrupa, which came out in two thousand nine, and I know your father Frank was a working animator who was the only one that was part of that group that went to South America. But I'm curious for you, even what interests you about the book, but also about that film where you were interested enough to spend a lot of time, I'm sure, in putting together that documentary. It was so fascinating uh, when we made the film of being in the footsteps of my father and, and the, the rest of El Grupo. And, you know, there's a, a real interesting emotional, visceral thing happens when you stand in an exact place and, and in many cases, see what they saw. And uh, I tried to communicate that in the film. And um, over time, JB and I and, and DDA also felt that, well, if you, could, if you could bottle that again and put it between two covers of a book, wouldn't that be sensational? You know, if you could share with others in this in a book format where you can flip forward and flip back and cross reference and it'd be terrific you know to take everybody on this trip pack your bag and let's go so uh, that was a big impetus for taking this project on especially done because um when um, there are a couple of things the, the, the first thing is the experience that all of us jb ten and i have had over the years is the more you focus on one very specific subject, the more things, new things you discover. Even when you think that the subject has been covered in depth already, you, you end up discovering a, a lot of new things. I had that experience uh, when I worked on the on, on, my, on one of my books, um, the, the book about the trip to Europe in 1935, Disney's Grand Tour. And I started realizing that there were lots of misconceptions uh, that if you started digging into the, the sources in local language, you would find a lot more details and, and that you would you would start really learning a lot of things and discovering lots of new photographs and new uh, new information and, and all of that. And um, thank you, JB. And uh, and so w when it came to the Latin American trip, I mean, obviously, JB had had worked on an amazing book um uh, south of the border with, with Disney, uh, which really focuses on on the making of all of the Latin American uh, productions, uh, and Saludos Amigos, the Three Caballeros, but also some of the, the shorts and the educational shorts, and and so on and so forth. And 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 Ted, as you mentioned, had worked on that on that wonderful documentary. Uh, 
I was really interested in, in understanding like on a day by day basis, uh, what the artists and Walt had done really during the trip. And I knew that if the three of us worked on that together, we could achieve a couple of things. The, the first one is we would make some new discoveries. Uh, we would, by just going like literally day by day, we we're talking about the two months and a half trip. So that's a lot of days. Uh, but, but doing it day by day, you would start finding new information, new material. The other thing is um, over the years, we had gathered diaries, we had gathered correspondence, we had gathered a lot of new elements from the people who were on the ground. And so I was starting to wonder, well, how does that fit in? Um, it would be great to see all of that in, in context. And then the third thing that, that happened is uh, I was in touch at the time with the, the son of one of the participants from the trip, Larry Lunsberg. And, and Larry Lunsberg also happened to be sort of the official photographer during the trip uh, and or one of them. And so he... Um, he had shot a lot and lots and lots and lots of photographs. And when, when his son sent me some, some documents, one of the boxes that were really one of the, like getting Christmas in August was a box full of photographs from that trip to Latin America, which wasn't what I was researching at the time when I contacted him. And so that came as a surprise. There were like 250 or 300 photographs from that trip. And I immediately obviously shared that with JB and Ted. And when we all looked at that, that was in the middle of the pandemic. We said, you know what, that would be a great pandemic project. And JB will be able to, to elaborate on that. But it, it was basically like, okay, that could serve as the basis of something that goes, um, I wouldn't say beyond, but that would do something different than what the documentary and JB's book achieved, that, that, that would, would, would look at it from a different angle and, and, and be really, really fun to work on. And, and JB, if you want to provide more context, uh, that would be fantastic. Well, basically, um, my experience and my angle on this is, is uh, an extension of what DDA was just saying. Uh, because in film history at large, and especially and, and including this project, um, that's 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 my racket. And and uh, so what what uh, Didier was just saying is kind of my theme song. Every road leads to another road. It, it, everything is connected, and and you never you never get to the end of it. Uh, there's one thing always leads to another. So in this case, you know, I I started when I when I wrote the earlier book. I was just attracted to the subject because because I love those films, Saludos and, and Three Caballeros. Uh, they're not like any other Disney films. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how fascinating. And it's clear that, that there are things bearing on those films that uh, were unlike the circumstances of any other. So I started with that long shot and then kind of uh, pulled in closer. And at the time, uh, that trip to South America in 1941... Uh, was literally the, just the first chapter in that story. And so in researching it, I did compile kind of a rough timeline of what happened when and, and who, you know, who was involved in each uh, step of the trip. But it was more of a kind of a general overview. And, and then just as, as DDA has been saying, the more closely you look at that, the more there is to see. And of course, as always, in researching a book, you pile up a lot more research material than you actually use in the book. I had files of my own, and it turned out that uh, DDA and Ted, from their differing experiences, had a lot of, of uh, research material, too. And we discovered that by pooling all of that collective research, we could really drill down and get into lots and lots of detail about exactly what was happening every step of the way. And it's fascinating stuff. So that was kind of the way that, it, that the monograph developed. Well, that leads really well into my question now, diving more into the book. You guys really led me in well. I don't even have to ask a lot of the questions. I just was going through my questions. You guys were just answering them all, which is great. But you kind of <laughs> answered what I wanted. That. Yeah, you guys are pros. But um, the itinerary, I mean, I know you mentioned the three of you pool, pooled your resources, which makes a lot of sense. But I was still amazed by just how much detail for a, you know, a trip that occurred 
quite a long time ago, you know, more than 80 years ago. Were there still gaps that were hard to fill or how difficult was it to then take all that information and really kind of drill down to say they did it on this day and this day and this day, which kind of is really the bulk of what is in the book? What's interesting to me is that uh, we were able to use the photographic record to cross-reference the written records. I mean, the, the written records were great in terms of journal, it's day-specific. And then this was the age of letter writing also. So after, you know, maybe a, a, a 16, 18-hour day of, of drawing and uh, you know, doing diplomatic chores and all the rest, the, the members of the group would get back to the hotel and, and write a letter home. <laughs> in the wee hours of the morning. So we had those things. But the, then, uh, back to my point, we had the photographs. Uh, in some cases, we knew where they were taken. On other times, uh, we were able to say, well, that couldn't have been that day. It must have been this day because of the written record. There, there are, I think, at least three places where we uh, made those discoveries. And, and uh the, the most unexpected of all was that uh, another one of our colleagues uh, found a photographic record of doing the voice recording for the Spanish version of Dumbo in Argentina. And uh, it was a real job of sleuthing for us to figure out uh, what days that had to have taken place because it, it could not ta have taken place before a certain window of days and we know it could not have taken place after. So uh, they were fun fun untying the knot experiences like that. Ted has likened this to putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. and I think that's I think that's a good analogy. If you if you take all of these many, many moving parts that that we uh, had to deal with and and start assembling them, it is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, but it resulted in a pretty exact record of what was happening each day of the trip. And and then the the other level of complexity in in all of this is that as as um, Ted or JB could, could point out is is the fact that at the beginning of the trip El Grupo Walt Disney and El Grupo they, they're all together they're all together in Brazil they're all together in Argentina but then after Argentina they split up they split up into mini grupitos uh, <laughs> and so. Um, it, it becomes even more difficult to, to, to track them. And the person who's there to, to keep the official record of, of what's going on, obviously is only on one of those trips, not, not on, the, on, on all of the ones that go in parallel. And so he has, his record is based on the information that the, the others give him, uh, but their memories are not always perfect. And so uh, after Brazil and Argentina, it becomes a little bit bit sketchier, it becomes a little bit less precise. And when you cross-reference that with the, the correspondence, but also the diaries, um, the photographic record, uh, the, uh, the, the the information in local newspapers, because that's the other source of material. Uh, we, we got volunteers on the ground that sent us newspapers from Argentina, from Brazil, and so on and so forth. And then, obviously, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I, I speak and, and read fluent Spanish and Portuguese, so I was able to, to help Help translate all of that. When when you pull all of that together and you cross reference all of that, you realize, huh, this could not really have happened. Like John Rose, the person who was making that that official um, program, uh, said it happened. Uh, it it must have happened this way. And then and then Ted, who has been on the ground and researched it for the movie, <laughs> said, well, it was physically impossible to be in this place at that point and in this other place at that, that other time, that was just not doable. So there must be another explanation. Mm -hmm. And so we would pull all of our resources and say, okay, so what's the other explanation? And then the, the more you dig and the more you focus on it and the, 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 the closer you get to, uh, to um, a logical explanation, and then you, you actually find the, uh, the, the, the real story. And, and it's really fun. It's, it's really like a detective, uh, a detective story or a de detective work. And uh, it's just, it's exhilarating. Rating. And and you might ask, well, <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> and and for me, the the point is it brings you much closer to the experience of these artists, what they lived, how they felt, you know, uh, how they were inspired, what they brought back with them. By knowing with more detail where they were, who they met, <laughs> you get a much better appreciation for 
did they have time to wash out their socks back at the hotel and <laughs> would they dry by the morning and you know and and uh, and little minutia like that that i think makes this whole thing a lot more human and, and to be honest then done i mean there are things that I, I realized when i was researching this which i should have known uh, beforehand but like when when they take uh, the planes there are some letters from, from Janet Martin, who was on the trip, where she mentions the fact that they have difficulty breathing and things like that. And I'm like, huh, why is that? And then I, I went, I, I, I spoke with Ted. I said, Ted, were, were the planes not pressurized at the time? He said, no, no, they weren't. And I'm like, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> and I, and I, it dawned on me, and I hadn't realized that at the time. I should have, but I, I didn't. And so it, it put things into a, a completely different perspective, a different light. Uh, uh, like um, I was researching, I mean, in another either part of this trip or another trip, and I realized, ha, huh, this this trip is taking really a long time to go to Los Angeles to to Mexico City, for example. And I, and I realized. Yeah, because there are like four stops in the middle. They have to refuel like four times. And it's it just it it just put things in a completely different context. So anyway. On several of those mini flights, they had little breathing tubes. They had they had to be supplied with oxygen, uh, especially at the higher altitudes. When they went over the Andes uh, from Argentina into Chile, uh, that's that's a really, really high altitude, and they had to have these breathing tubes. Yeah, it's it's a whole different experience. Yeah, I noticed it too when you talked about like how the hotel issues they had or how the different group had to split up. And I'm picturing, oh, this was a really glamorous trip. Like you see the video, the photos of them all in suits meeting the government officials. And I'm thinking this is really fancy. And then you mentioned the plane and I think about the hotel and I'm like, oh, so were there other things that surprised all of you as you dug further like that, that you maybe didn't anticipate until you dug in this far? Well, there were things like um, learning the differences between the different uh, currencies of the various <laughs> countries they went to. They had they had to learn how to uh, recalculate, you know, tips and and uh, the cost of a meal and and the cost of a taxi ride in terms of whatever currency was used in the country they were in. You know, uh, Ted Sears, the head of the story department, a real funny guy. He wrote home and said when they were in Brazil. Brazil was having hyperinflation at the time, so that when you took a, a taxi ride, you you had to you know dole out like a huge bag of coins in order to pay the <laughs> cab driver. And it, he said it made you feel like a real millionaire. You know, <laughs> it's a five dollar ride or something like that, and you make you feel like you're playing Monopoly. Yeah, yeah. He said you you really feel like like a, a rich man if you're if you're handing out a million of anything. <laughs> um, because of the yeah, because as Ted says, because of the inflation, and, and uh, then to, to add to all of this, I mean, I, I would say that aside from the the written record that 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 shares sort of those specific experiences and so on in in, in those different countries, uh, the other thing that's really great in 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 this book, and I can say it's great because it it wasn't uh, me doing it; it was our art director doing this, uh, is that we're trying to really take people back there and, and give them the experience of, of traveling with, with El Grupo. And to do that, our art director realized that there were two things that he needed to do uh, beyond what, what we had provided to him. One is that he created some maps uh, that really, really clarify um, how things were happening and when and how. Uh, and then the other thing he did is that he um, gathered, collected like artifacts from the time period uh, that, that really allow you to have the, the experience of, of really traveling like uh, uh, baggage tags and, uh, and, and postcards from, from some of the, uh, uh, the hotels where they were staying and uh, different like visual elements that complement um, the, the record in terms of photographs that, that were taken during the trip. And, and, and obviously the idea is to really immerse you into that trip uh, in, in a very visceral way. Yeah, that's true. His his our art director's name is Steve Reeser, and he is uh, a brilliant designer. I, I think uh, a lot of what is great about this monograph comes from him because he really manages to visually immerse you 
in the trip. It, that that goes a long way toward recreating the experience that El Grupo had. And actually, we should mention his wife too, Virginia Reeser. She was the project uh, director on this, and there were so many little details of this. It was a huge job to coordinate everything, and she doesn't. She doesn't always get the credit she deserves, but she played a big part in this, too. I kind of knew we were on to something special when uh, Steve and Virginia started asking us about details of the day, you know, and, and realizing, well, how long did it take for them to get from point A to point B? How long did it take to go from Copacabana Beach up to Portela? You know, and that was sort of the genesis of the idea of maps. And the next thing you know, <laughs> Every day, Steve was like sending me a, a new version of a, of a map, you know, whether it be Buenos Aires or, or Rio de Janeiro or the hop over the Andes, you name it. And it, it really has, we, we've joked, but it, I, I think it gives you the, the feeling of the, the ultimate triptych that you have in your <laughs> hands. It's a historical triptych, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, that brings up a great point, because if you just said, hey, this is an itinerary of what they did every day for multiple months and didn't really explain. No, it's presented in this artistic way. It'd be like, really? That sounds kind of dry, you know? But when you look at the book itself, especially combining with the photos and with everything, like you mentioned, it's really attractive to look at and go through. It's not your, It's not something that's dry or just, you know, boring history. It's really interesting. And so I, I know you mentioned this already, DDA, but for all of you, any of you, about the photos, because I feel like, I'm still amazed of how you gathered all of it. So I'm curious to know a little more about those photos, whether it came from Walt Disney Archives or personal collections or whatnot. You know, you mentioned one example already, but kind of how you were able to get so many and so many clear, really good photos where you'd see things happening in the foreground and the background. And there's just so much within them, just within each page. And I'm constantly looking at captions and figuring out what it is. How did all that come together where you had enough photos where you could just document so much? It actually came together over a period of years, just gradually in, in, in phases. Uh, I can tell you that when I, uh, when I, first, when I first started working on, on my earlier book, my experience was a lot like the one that DDA described earlier, except this came from the daughter of Norm Ferguson, the great Disney artist, Norm Ferguson, who uh, was, was the supervising director of the, uh, of the Good Neighbor films. He was on the trip. And uh, his daughter contacted me, and this is a good 15 or 20 years ago. She contacted me and said that she had this, this big box of material that her father had saved from his time at Disney. And would I be interested in going through it? Well, I thought it over, you know, for <laughs> a fraction of a second and said, yes, I would. So, and at the time, I wasn't even thinking about the Latin American films, but it turned out that a lot of what was in this box was photos from the trip to South America in 1941. And that just, that really lit the fuse for me. And again, one thing led to another, but but starting out with that little collection of photos that Ferguson had saved, then we went on to some of the other collections that have been, that have turned up in other places. I think that's what DDA was starting to tell you about. Yeah, what I was going to say, Dan, is basically 95% or 98% of the photographs in this book appear in a book for the very first time. They haven't been released in other books before. And that was very that was a very conscious decision. All of us, Ted, JB, myself, have all of the books ever published on, on the subject or related to the subjects. And so we, we really wanted to show new material. And the material is coming from I would say four different sources. Obviously, the material that JB had gathered uh, at the time for for his book, uh, a little bit of material from the, the Disney archives, but not not a huge amount, uh, but but some good amount, some some very important things. A lot of material that Ted had gathered for his documentary, uh, and he'll be able to to tell you more about that. And then obviously this massive collection of, of photos that came from Larry Landsberg. Uh, that that was sort of the at, at the at the start of that very project that that made us realize oh this is this is the good a good foundation to 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 build on uh ted you wanted to uh, you wanted to say something well i had the advantage of you know being in the countries you know retracing the footsteps of, of el grupo so naturally i met descendants of the people who uh hosted them and and uh, interacted with them. And in every instance, uh, there would be photographs, snapshots, or mementos 
uh, that we could share with each other. And, uh, and then also uh, there were the national archives in these different countries that uh, we were able to have access to and, and, um, and private foundations as well who uh, allowed us to use uh, some of their photographic material at the time. And of course, I banked those. I, you know, we've, we've had them since the time that we made Walton El Grupo. And I think that they, you know, it's something about this topic that has always fascinated me is that it was never a one-way trip. It was never the Disney party helicoptering in and seeing different uh, sites in, in Latin America. It was definitely a, a two-way exchange. Uh, and I think it had as much impact on the Disney group as it did on the people uh, who hosted them. Time and again, I would be amazed at how fresh the memories were in in um, the family stories or the the histories that people I met in Latin America had. You would think it was not uh, 60 years before. It was six months ago is from the way they talk. So, I mean, that's something that's interesting, too, just from your film and then also from the book, is just what was the atmosphere like from what you've learned when they would go to various places with the people there and how they connected? Because we've talked a lot about the book and then about what Disney did, but the overall back and forth, like, what did you guys learn about what the experience was like on both ends, I guess? Well, what was remarkable about the trip, I think, is that they had uh, interactions with from the, the top of society to the most everyday folks you can imagine. You know, it, it wasn't targeted only at government people. It, you know, you had the, the cream of the crop of uh, people of arts and letters in every single country, uh, as, as well as, like I say, uh, everyday folks. And you have to remember that at, the, at that time, in 1941, Walt Disney was a cultural hero. He was, he was probably more highly regarded uh, in artistic circles at that time than maybe any other time in his career, because this is just coming off of the making of, of beautiful films like, well, especially Fantasia. And in fact, they were in these various and not by a coincidence, they were in these, these various South American nations just at the time that Fantasia opened there. So they were able to attend these premieres. So Walt was just, he was, he was just on, on a, a level of celebrity that, that um, really made this an event. Everywhere they went, uh, they were greeted by people who were just overjoyed to meet uh, the great Walt Disney and the artists who worked with him. And then that's that's valid not just during the trip in 1941, but then even with the return trip to to Latin America uh, in 42, 43, and so on. That that still happens. I mean, in, just to take one or two examples, when when Walt goes to to Mexico for the first time in December 1942, uh, he's uh, at at meetings with uh, the great muralist Diego Rivera. And with his wife Frida Kahlo, uh, he meets with one of the the most prominent caricaturist in, in Mexico, Miguel Covarrubias. He, he's really meeting with the, the top of the intellectuals and, 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 and artists in, 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 all of those, in all of those countries, uh, really, at the time. That's really interesting because, again, looking at it less as like, you know, looking at him as, you know, which throughout his career is the case, but I think this is pre-Uncle Walt, pre, you know, TV and where he kind of got on a different persona where he was an artist. I mean, related to that, basically when they returned, I mean, we talked about it a little bit, JB did in, in the intro, but how did this, do you guys feel knowing everything you know, impact Disney just going forward because, you know, especially coming out of the war or even what they created right away, like what was the impact maybe even long-term on Walt and on, on Disney there? Well, you, you know, I have always felt that the trip was uh, fundamental to Walt getting his creative rhythm back because of the financial problems and the labor problems at the studio. I think he was really going through a, a dry spell uh, when the trip began, because you know every he was blunted at every turn, he couldn't go forward, and the 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 trip working with a small group of people, uh, doing creative brainstorming for the entire length of the trip, uh, he really got his juices flowing again and was ready to go when they got back to Burbank. But I mean, oh, six weeks, six weeks after they got back to Burbank, Pearl Harbor happened, and 
Uh, anybody who knows Disney history knows how the the studio lot was transformed overnight, and suddenly you were a, a war plan. So it's really quite remarkable that they were able to go ahead uh, with the films planned at all. It really is nothing short of extraordinary, especially when you realize that now the the talent pool at the at the studio was being uh, pulled away either through enlistment or by the draft. So you had uh, many, many of your top artists um, in uniform now, or if they were still at the studio, they were doing, uh, uh, you know, war-related uh, projects. To me, you know, you look at the way the films came out, you know, JB sort of alluded to this, that circumstances uh, played, had a very heavy thumb on the scale about how these films were done. One of the other ways, then, that that affected Walt, and, and you can see that, um, especially after the 40s, um, throughout the 50s, is that I feel that he got even more interested than he already was in other cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you can trace the roots of the People and Places series, for example, uh, to that to, to that very specific trip, um, and 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 a lot of the other things that he will explore in terms of um, movies that have that take place in other countries, uh, especially in live action and and so on and so forth. I think all of that can be traced back to that trip to Latin America that that really opened his eyes to. Uh, uh, not just sort of occidental uh, cultures, but but even be beyond that. Yeah, and Didier, you mentioned that they also had return trips, which, so I'm curious, I know that you guys are still working on possibly another part to this, so I'm curious to know a little more about the the subsequent trips too if people aren't familiar with that but then also what might it might lead into for for you guys doing something in the future. So yeah, I mean, in in a nutshell, uh, after they went to that trip uh, for two and a half months to to Latin America in 1941, there are some follow up trips, and uh, there are quite a few trips to to Mexico, uh, especially. Um, there are a few trips to uh, uh, Central America, uh, and those are more linked to the uh, health um, educational uh, projects. And, and JB can can tell you more uh, about those. And then they are also planning so the trips to mexico are really focused on additional research for the three caballeros the second of the latin american uh, package features and then it was supposed to be a third one that that was in development and that was gonna uh, include a, a big uh, cuban sequence and so for a while it was called cuban carnival uh, and so there were two trips uh, to Cuba, one in 1943 and one in 1944. Uh, Walt wasn't part of those trips. Uh, Walt had been to Cuba once in 1931 for vacation, uh, but he wasn't part of those research trips to, to Cuba in 43 and 44. But but quite a few of his artists were part of those trips. Mary Blair was part of the first one, and then uh, Freddie Moore, among others, was part of the 1944 trip. Uh, and, and all of those trips have been documented uh, in part by by JB in in his book, but again, it was a small part of a, of a fascinating and and very long book, and and so the idea of that sequel to to the monograph we just released is to say, okay, what do we know about those follow up trips, and what else can we find out, and can we do the same thing we just did with the 1941 trip and and follow those new groupos uh, to those different places, sort of day by day and understand what they did. And, and I'll just um, conclude by saying that one of the main difficulties when we started looking into this, starting about a year ago, was that we realized that whereas for the 1941 trip, there were hundreds of photographs that we had discovered uh, for the trips to Mexico and, and Cuba. Well, for Mexico, the Disney archives had about five or six photos um, and by the time we, we ended up digging a bit deeper, there were maybe 10 photos at the Disney archives for those Mexican trips. Ted had one or two also for those Mexican trips. And then for Cuba, um, Ted had about 20 or 25 photos. And that was it. And, and we realized, okay, this is not going to be enough. We, we need to dig deeper. If, and so 
with volunteers on the ground, especially in, in, in Mexico, and, and with also detective work where we found other people that were part of the trip and their families and so on and so forth. By now, with, with local resources and all of that, we're at about 150 to 200 photos. Uh, so way, way more than what we had at, at the start. And so it's becoming really enough to, uh, to prepare a, a fascinating and, and really, really, really detailed volume uh, about the subject, especially when we realized that one of the uh, uh, one of our members uh, and one of our co um, one of the other historians that in our group, Jim Hollyfield, had some fascinating additional material on on Cuba and photographs, and I just yesterday got another photograph from that trip to Cuba that no one had seen before, which was incredibly exciting. So. A lot of really, really good stuff uh, happening at the moment, uh, and we haven't even started like uh, uh, conducting the, the, the follow-up uh, research visits to the Disney archives. JB, do you want to um, add, add a few things on, on all of this? DDA has, has really pretty well covered it, but it is, it is the case. It's what we were talking about a little while ago. One thing always leads to another. So by the time, well, to back up a little bit, by the time they finished uh, working with the material that they picked up in 1941, uh, they were putting a lot of stress on the music of each of these countries. And so with, with Mexico, you know, it wasn't as big an operation to plan a trip to Mexico as it was to South America, because Mexico was just across the border from, from where they were working. So they could make multiple trips, and they focused a lot on the music there. And a lot of what you see them doing in Mexico is auditioning musical talent, some of which shows up on the screen in Three Caballeros. Well, they were going to do the same thing uh, in Cuba, and there was a very, very rich tradition of music, of popular music in Cuba, uh, much of which was already internationally popular. There was already a vogue for uh, many of these Cuban popular songs in the U.S. even before the Good Neighbor Project started. So a lot of really uh, wonderful music was turned up in, in these trips, uh, not to mention all of the visual material that they picked up. It was, it's, uh, again, the closer you look, the more there is to see. Sorry, I just had one one quick thing because it ties directly to what what JB uh, mentioned. And then basically, the the really great thing about music being central to all of this is that in Mexico City and and also in Cuba, uh, the the people who would sort of guide them uh, via in those trips in Mexico and in Cuba were people linked to the music producer Rolf Peer. And uh, what was great is that he's. Uh, uh, one of his family members is still around and uh, preserved all of the diaries from his wife, uh, plus some correspondence and, and photographs and other elements. And so that's where we were able to discover, for example, for the Mexican trip, uh, the first uh, color photographs from that trip, uh, which were which are really really amazing photos, just uh, uh, so full of colors. I mean, they are Kodachrome uh, uh, photos, and it's it's just it's absolutely stunning. Go ahead, uh, Ted. Sorry, I well, well I, you know, talking about the music, it it brings to mind uh, what I think is one of the most beneficial pieces of fallout from this entire experience is the degree to which. Um, the, the Disney projects were positive pollinators around the world for uh, popular culture from these different nations. You know, the fact that before the 1941 trip, the samba was practically unknown outside of Brazil. And after Saludos Amigos, everybody knew the samba. And it was a, a similar thing with what Ralph Peer was doing with great uh, musicians and songwriters in Mexico and, and in, in Cuba. And uh, certainly after Blame It on the Samba, you know, this music was, was much, much better known throughout the world. Yeah, it's a great point because it's easy to think about, well, especially in the Internet age, but even even more rec even in the, you know, when I grew up, 80s, 90s, whatever, how music is just everywhere. But it's very it's very different at the time. So that that's a really great point. I want to make sure, too, you know, we've talked about so much with the history. And I mentioned the Hyperion Historical Alliance. We also mentioned the monograph series. And I want to make sure to, if people aren't familiar for, you know, you guys to get a chance to talk about, because I know, you know, recently published JB, your book on Walt Disney's Fun and Fancy Free in the series, the making of that. Also True Life Adventures book, the DDA you did. So I'm curious if you guys could give, you know, 
a summary of what the HHA is really about, and then also this monograph series and kind of why it's you enjoy it and why it seems to work so well for this material. As far as the as the publishing, the, the HHA, the, the Hyperion Historical Alliance, uh, is really DDA's baby, and uh, I think that uh, he can he can really shed the best light on that because he really started the ball rolling and is still the president of the alliance. As far as the publishing projects are concerned, this this grew out of the idea that we we're accumulating all this wonderful material and and preserving it, uh, and we should we should publish works that that document this and and let the rest of the world in on it. So um, so we've started these various publishing uh, projects, one of which is um, the annual series, which is a journal that, that uh, brings out uh, articles by our various members of, about specific aspects of Disney history. And then the monographs, of which this is one, taking the same idea to, to a higher level and taking one specific topic and really drilling down into it with much, much uh, detail uh, and many, many illustrations that have not been seen before. Uh, what I really love about that is that we all, I think we all can say that we love Disney history, but you know, within the field of, of Disney history, there are the famous milestones, and then there are all the little nooks and crannies that come in between. Well, we really love those nooks and crannies, and, and the idea of the monographs is to shed more light on those those lesser known subjects and and give people a window into all the stories that that you haven't heard before or that are that are so crucial to Disney history and make sure that they are documented and don't get lost and so then um, a, a few elements about about the Hyperion Historical Alliance and, and a few elements about what's coming up in the in the monograph series. Uh, so the Hyperion Historical Alliance was started about 15 years ago, and the idea was that a lot of the um, a lot of the Disney artists and even a lot of their family members were were not getting younger, and so we, we realized that they they were collections uh, of documents, written documents, photographs, artwork, and so on, outside of the Disney archives that needed to be preserved, needed to be scanned in high resolution, so that we we wouldn't lose whole aspects of, of Disney history uh, when when those documents would be, get dispersed or, God forbid, thrown in, into the trash can. Uh, and so we, we started working with all of those families to uh, to really preserve, to scan basically all of those documents and make sure that they were um, preserved for future generations of, of Disney historians. Uh, and, and as JB explained, that led to... Um, trying to share some of those documents with a wider audience, uh, put into context via th those those publication projects, both the annuals and the and the monographs. Now, in, in terms of the monograph series, wh what's coming up after the El Grupo monograph is, is pretty staggering. I mean, we have... Uh, we have a series of, of four monographs uh, being written by a, a former Imagineer, uh, Tom Morris, about the origins of Walt Disney Imagineering and, and really the early years of Walt Disney Imagineering. It's going to be absolutely revolutionary. It's going to um, reestablish the foundation for all future history of, of the Disney parks and 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 about Imagineering. Uh, it's just it's it's really mind blowing that the work he's been doing, uh, and and we're. We're hoping to have the first one released next year. Um, we uh, were working, I mean, talk about subjects that where you think, okay, everything should have been written on that subject, and then you, you find new information. Well, take Mickey Mouse and the 1930s, like the golden age of, of, of the studio, and then the most famous character of, of the studio. Well, uh, between my co-author Libby Spatz and, and myself, we found so much new material about Mickey's career outside of the, the big screen and outside of, of comic books, meaning the parades, the Christmas celebrations, marionette shows, radio shows, and, and the Mickey Mouse clubs from the 1930s. We found so much material that a monograph that was going to be just one monograph is now three monographs. Uh, and and it's it's all new stuff. It's all new material, visually and, and, and text-wise. Uh, and then, obviously, we're going to get into the live-action um, uh, movies. And so the, the, one of the first ones, uh, well, actually, two of the first ones, one is going to be about the making of Swiss Family Robinson, 
Johnson uh, by um, uh, Kevin Kidney, Jody Daly, and Aaron Wilcott. And, and one is going to be about the making of Darby O'Gill and the little people. And, and there is a whole research trip or actually several research trips that, that do happen, um, which, which, which is really the first big research trip after those, those ones in Latin America, uh, the one to Ireland in 1946. And, and Jim Holyfield and myself discovered so much new material about those research trips and about the actual making of the, of, of the movie. And a lot more to come. I mean, JB is working on on quite a few uh, new monographs also, and and we have several other members that are that are tackling uh, uh, great things, like uh, one about uh, the um, the publicity artist uh, Hong Porter, uh, and and then way more than we could mention in, in in just a few minutes. So it's really exciting. Yeah, it's I'm I don't know how I'm going to keep up with all of these. There's just so much information you guys are releasing, which is great. Yeah, I talked to Tom. On this podcast, this was a few years ago. I remember when he was digging into the research. I know this has been something he's been working on for a long time. So I'm, I'm super excited for that and just a lot more of what you're doing. It's it sounds it's amazing how much more information just keeps appearing. Like with this book, it's that you we've been talking about today. Well, I have one last big question for you guys, which is just kind of as a takeaway question. It can be a, for you or for people that are reading. What's something that, as you kind of sum up this Walt Nell Grupo book, that you want people to take away or even that, you know, you kind of pull away from the experience? Ted, I'll start with you. Any, basically, be anything that you kind of, as you summarize it, that really stands out to you from the experience? Well, one of the subjects that I have tried to explore in all of my work, and, and no less so in this book, is uh, the whole process of making art. You know, I, I'm definitely interested in the history, but even more than that, I'm interested in the lives of artists, how they create, um, how do you go about creating? You know, it's it's not necessarily a, a, a lightning bolt that, that strikes you. It, there's a, a creative personality and there's a lot of uh, elbow grease that goes into it. So being able to explore that and the, the way the artists and the world that they travel through rub off on each other, I think we've been pretty successful in uh, putting, distilling some of that and putting it across in the book. And I hope that people will enjoy that when they, when they crack the cover. JB, how about you? There are any number of things, but I think one of the most important ones is uh, to dwell on the, the diplomatic function. Again, the government... In, in proposing this trip in the first place, they wanted to cement good relations between North and South and Central America, uh, mainly to stand against the Axis influence that was that was being established there. So there was a there was a uh, an agenda there, but in fact, um, the bonds of goodwill that that El Grupo established went far beyond just diplomatic requirements. Uh, they really the artists really bonded with the artists in other countries, and they're. It wasn't just a it wasn't just a phony diplomatic thing. There were really some lasting friendships that were formed out of that, and some some genuine goodwill between all of these countries. You know, there was and and, and bear in mind, as as Ted said earlier, uh, this was all happening at the same time that the war was going on. So this 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 was done against the context of a world at war, and there was a radio broadcast uh, just. When Saludos Amigos was about to be released in the U.S., there was a big radio broadcast to celebrate that. And one of the statements that Walt made on this radio broadcast, uh, I always remember, uh, he said, while half of this world is being forced to shout, Heil Hitler, our answer is to say, Saludos Amigos. And they put that, that positivity and that goodwill out into the world. I think that is so important, and the effects are still being felt today. That's something that I'd like people to take away from this. And from my standpoint, Dan, uh, I, I would say that th th there are two things. One, uh, obviously, having lived myself in, in Latin America for a few years and being married to a Brazilian, um, one of the elements that really uh, interests me is to understand how people on the ground uh, reacted to, uh, to to that visit. Uh, and so I think we're, we're doing a really good job in terms of sharing some of those reactions. And and uh, at the end, you have a whole appendix with with 
great uh, newspaper articles that that do share some of that um, f- from a very uh, f- from some very specific perspectives. And then the other thing is, I think it would be fun for a lot of people to try and sort of. Uh, follow the footsteps of El Grupo at some point and try and and uh, and go on a trip that would go to a lot of the same uh, the same places. Well, some of the hotels still exist, some don't. But uh, I don't know. I had the pleasure of staying at the Hotel Gloria at some point in uh, in Rio de Janeiro, and once uh, I was really really fortunate to be able to stay for a few nights at the Alvear Palace in Buenos Aires. Um, and so that was on a professional trip, but Ted, uh, and um, I could not afford that one. Um, and so, 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 yeah, I hope that that some people will will actually uh, get the book and and say, you know, why don't we try and and travel in the footsteps of Walden and Grupo one day? That that would be that would be really fun. I would love to be part of that trip. Oh, that's great. That's that's the framework for I'm sure someone could take on that trip. I don't know if they could do it for two to three months, but you know, I guess you could just do parts of it at a time. But well, guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. I really love the book. So I'll leave this to whoever wants to answer. But um, if listeners want to learn about this book or purchase a copy or learn about the HHA, where are some good places they should go online to find out about it? Sure. So you have uh, you have two um, main places to go to uh, on on Facebook. There is a group called the Hyperion Historical Alliance Press, and that will give information about all of our new uh, publication releases. And then to order the book, the best place is a bookstore in Los Angeles, which you can find online called Stuart Ng Books. Stuart Ng Books. Uh, so Stuart Ng Books. That's the best place to to order the, the the monographs. It's our official distributor um, in in the US, and and that's really where to go to uh, uh to to get the book. Well, awesome. Well, guys, this has been great. I could ask you another ten million questions about this. I think about each day of the trip, basically. But this has been great, and I hope that listeners. I really like the book. You guys should definitely check it out. Thank you all so much for being on the podcast. Oh, well, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been our pleasure to do this. A delight, really. Well, that was really fun. And I wanted to apologize. I know JB's audio got a little shaky near the end, but tried to edit it the best I could. But I think the message still came across. But apologize if that was a bit jarring there at the end. Well, if you enjoyed this episode, there are 240 past shows, including interviews with authors like Dave Bossert and Bethany Bemis and Catherine Mayer and Greg Glasgow, all focusing on Disney history like this one. You can check that out. Just go back in your podcast apps, Spotify, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, wherever, or you can go to tomorrowsociety.com slash podcast with an S at the end, and you can easily find all the shows laid out by type. Imagineers, authors, podcasters, trip reports, all kinds of different shows that I think you are going to enjoy. I'd like to give a big thanks to some members of the Tomorrow Society through Patreon, Matt Hauser, Carrie Huff and Beth Bramlett. Thank you all so much for being members of our society and helping to support the show for so long, going back to the middle of 2019. Man, I've been doing the show for a long time, but I still enjoy doing it, especially when there's interviews like this week that are just fun to do. If you'd like to learn how to support the show and get access to some exclusive podcasts and other perks, go to patreon.com slash tomorrow society, or you can just make a one-time donation and buy me a Dole Whip. Go to tomorrowsociety.com slash Dole Whip to learn more. If you'd like to get a hold of me, I love getting emails from you guys. Send me an email. Let me know what you thought. Dan at tomorrowsociety.com. Of course, you can follow me at all the social medias. I've been trying to stay out there a little less, but I'll definitely respond, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook threads, wherever. Search for Tomorrow Society. Also, check out the Tomorrow Society YouTube channel. I have some fun videos coming out, including I'm going to do an analysis of the Lost Island Coaster Fire Runner. I just released that one, so I hope you enjoyed that. It was fun to put together. They're bringing out a new RMC Raptor in 2025. The music you're hearing right now was written by Adam Hookie and performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Next time, I'm going to be talking with author Amy Ratcliffe about many of her books on Star Wars and fandom, especially her book on the art of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. That book includes some incredible concepts. 
really excited to talk to Amy about her background, but then also what went into that book and some of her other amazing books. You should definitely check out a lot of her work. Thank you so much for listening to this interview with three guests, with Didier Guest, Ted Thomas, and J.B. Kaufman. They were all awesome, and it was very fun to do. I really appreciate that you are listening to this podcast after we've been around for so long. There's a lot of great shows out there, and you taking the time to give an hour of your week to this show means a lot to me. I hope you're all doing awesome out there, and I'll talk to you again very soon.